on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at I am Nikki Strong. I A M N I K K I S T R O N G. I am Nikki Strong, and this is V O A One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn. And Anna Mateo. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, the worldwide fishing industry has slowed since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. But experts say it is unclear if the slowdown will help endangered sea life recover. Hours recorded by fishermen at sea fell by nearly 10 percent around the world after the March 11th declaration of a pandemic. Fishing completely stopped in countries that were most affected by the coronavirus, such as China. The drop in fishing has raised questions about food security, ocean management, and worldwide trade. As countries return to fishing, experts are wondering whether an extended fishing slowdown could help rare ocean animals. One such animal is the North Atlantic right whale. Only about 400 of the whales remain, and they face a deadly risk of being caught in fishing equipment. Many other rare species. Face the same risk. Less fishing could also help some kinds of fish in the Mediterranean, like the overfished Atlantic bluefin tuna. David Krudzma is a research director for the nonprofit group Global Fishing Watch. He said it is too early to tell if less fishing is helping sea creatures. He added that since millions of people depend on fishing to make a living, any help to sea life has come at a cost. I don't think we should be celebrating anything here, not by making people suffer incredibly, Krudzma said. I bet what we'll find is it is not sufficient for rebuilding stocks in places that have to rebuild. Fishermen around the world recorded about 6.8 million hours at sea from March 11th to April 28th. That is down about 700,000 hours from averages the previous two years. Information from Global Fishing Watch shows. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization said the pandemic has brought problems that could keep fishing difficult. For an unknown period of time, Krudzma said, in countries that had a large number of virus cases, such as Italy, Spain, and France, fishing dropped 50 to 75 percent. Fishing decreased because of concerns about spreading the virus on boats and because of less demand for seafood. Two thirds of U.S. seafood spending is in restaurants. A recent study in the journal Nutrients reported. Thousands of those restaurants remain closed because of social distancing rules. As a result, some fishermen are bringing in less fish this year. The American catch of Atlantic herring was down more than one fifth. Almost 1.4 million kilograms through the end of May, according to federal data. Herring is an important species because it is used as human food and also to catch other sea creatures, such as lobster. 
None of this necessarily means that fish populations are rebuilding, said Gavin Gibbons. He is a spokesman for the National Fisheries Institute trade group. The plans to help species recover can be highly technical and take years to complete, Gibbons said. But in some parts of the world, there is hope that less fishing will help weak environmental systems recover. Ravika Ranavosan is marine conservation director at the Wildlife Conservation Society. She said that in Madagascar, overfishing and the effects of climate change are threatening the health of many forms of ocean life. We're always concerned about people using illegal fishing gear and not respecting rules about the size of fish catches and other restrictions, she said. She added that her team has worked with local communities to try to develop more sustainable practices. The long-term effects of the fishing slowdown remain to be seen, especially with coastal communities starting to return to work. We're definitely seeing cleaner water, fewer ships out, and fewer entanglements, said Jake Bleach, a spokesman for the group Defenders of Wildlife. We'll see what happens when the economy restarts. An Afghan man has reopened a long-shut oxygen factory to provide free service to patients suffering from COVID-19. Najibula Siddiqui says he closed his factory in 2013 because he had difficulty signing deals with hospitals to supply oxygen. But as the coronavirus continued to spread in Afghanistan, he saw a big need for oxygen that his old factory could help fill. I saw a man crying for his wife, who died from coronavirus due to lack of oxygen, Siddiqui told the Associated Press. That moment, I made the decision to reopen my factory. Now, family members of Afghans suffering with COVID-19 line up at his factory in Kabul to receive free oxygen refills that can keep their loved ones alive. Afghanistan has struggled with shortages of medical oxygen during the coronavirus crisis. It gets its oxygen cylinders from outside the country. Until recently, imports were halted because of border controls. Shortages have caused the price of new oxygen containers to rise sharply to about $250. The price to refill the containers is now $25, five times what it once was. Many people blame the increases on overcharging by retail sellers and government failures to guarantee a supply. Siddiqui's free service is a popular solution for many poor people hit by the virus. As word of the free service spreads on social media, vehicles line up with people seeking to refill cylinders. This factory is doing great work offering it for free, Bilal Hamidi told the AP. He said he fills three small cylinders a day for his brother, who was infected with the virus while caring for their mother. Their mother died of COVID-19 in early June. 
The factory was dusty and the equipment run down when Siddiqui decided to restart production. But everything still worked. I'm happy I didn't sell these machines, Siddiqui said. He hired twelve men to help. He even moved into the factory temporarily so he can react to situations quickly. I'm worried that I go home and someone in intense need comes late at night and doesn't find anyone to help them. His factory refills about 200 to 300 small cylinders a day for COVID-19 patients, for free. For hospitals and retail sellers, he fills nearly 700 large cylinders a day for about $3.80. He said that is far below the usual rate, but still enough to cover his costs. Retail sellers deny that they have been overcharging for oxygen. Imports of cylinders from the United Arab Emirates and China stopped for months because of restrictions related to the virus. They recently started again. However, unbalanced supply and demand has caused prices to rise, Kanjan Alkazai told the AP. He is a board member at the country's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Afghan media reported last week that several COVID-19 patients died in government hospitals because of a lack of oxygen. The government denied the reports. Lawmaker Fatima Aziz, who was infected with the coronavirus, spoke about the issue in a video from her hospital bed. She was shown receiving oxygen through her nose. In the video, she blamed corruption and government failures for the shortages. People lose their life for two drops of oxygen, she said. The lawmaker denounced mafia groups that she accused of taking over the medical oxygen business. A health ministry spokeswoman told the AP that hospitals were working to reduce oxygen shortages. Siddiqui's factory is one of six in Kabul that produce oxygen, but his is the only one giving free refills. My only aim is to save as many lives as I can, he said. When the virus spread ends, then I'll go home. I'm Brian Lynn. Learning English. This is the Health and Lifestyle Report. Drug maker Regeneron Pharmaceuticals announced on Monday it has started late-stage human testing of an antibody treatment for COVID-19. It said the tests are designed to show the drug's effectiveness in preventing and treating the disease. Regeneron is launching one of the drug trials jointly with the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The company said the goal is to test the drug's ability to prevent infections in persons who have had close contact with a COVID-19 patient. Regeneron said it hopes the late-stage drug trial will involve about 2,000 patients across the United States. George D. Yankopoulos is a co-founder and president of the New York-based company. He said in a statement, We are running simultaneous adaptive trials in order to move as quickly as possible to provide a potential solution to prevent and treat COVID-19 infections, even in the midst of an ongoing global pandemic. Yankopoulos noted that the antibody treatment 
could be available much sooner than a vaccine. Regeneron is holding two separate late-stage trials following a positive review from an independent group of Region Cove 2 Phase 1 safety results. The earlier tests involved 30 hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19. The company said the late-stage Phase 3 prevention trial will take place at about 100 testing centers in the U.S. The aim of the trial is to examine SARS-CoV-2 infection status. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19 disease. The other Phase 2 and 3 treatment trials are planned across 150 sites in the U.S., Brazil, Mexico, and Chile. The trials will include over 1,800 hospitalized and 1,000 non-hospitalized patients. Antibodies are chemical molecules. The body's natural defenses produce antibodies to fight off infection. The U.S. National Institutes of Health notes that some researchers are testing whether antibodies against COVID-19 could be used as a treatment to others who are infected. Others are studying the structure and work of different antibodies to help guide the development of vaccines. There are concerns that the novel coronavirus can change in humans and resist the antibodies. Regeneron's Region Cove 2 treatment combines a genetically modified antibody made by the company and a second antibody from recovered COVID-19 patients. The treatment is designed to connect the antibodies to the virus that causes COVID-19 and limit its ability to spread in an infected person. This idea has previously been used to develop drugs to treat other viruses, such as HIV, the cause of AIDS. Yankopoulos noted last month that individual antibodies, no matter how good, are likely not enough against the devastating virus that causes COVID-19 and the ways it seeks to escape being neutralized. The results of the Region Cove 2 study were published June 15th in Science. Other drug makers have begun human trials of their experimental treatments for fighting COVID-19. The companies include Gilead Sciences, Eli Lilly, and AbV. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Abraham Lincoln. He was the 16th President of the United States. Many Americans consider him one of the country's greatest leaders. Yet people alive when Lincoln was elected in 1860 would probably be surprised by modern-day opinions about him. He had little formal education or government experience. During the presidential campaign, critics made fun of his appearance and his simple way of talking. They warned that he was not very intelligent and would harm the nation's image. Some of his opponents, especially in southern states had even bigger concerns. They were afraid Lincoln would use the power of the federal government to end slavery in their states. They were right. Abraham Lincoln was born in the frontier state of Kentucky. 
His family was very poor and had a simple home, a log cabin. Lincoln had to support his parents and his sister by working, so he rarely went to school. Instead, he taught himself by reading books. Eventually, he became a lawyer in the state of Illinois. As a young man, Lincoln was known for several qualities. He was tall and thin. He was very strong. His neighbors remembered him cutting down trees. And he was honest. The people he defended in court called him Honest Abe. In time, Lincoln was elected to the Illinois General Assembly, the state's legislature. He also served one term as a congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives. But he was not popular there. Voters did not like his opposition to the country's war with Mexico. So Lincoln withdrew from politics and turned his attention to his family. He had married a Southern belle named Mary Todd in 1842. They had four sons, but two died when they were very young. Lincoln also developed his legal career representing railroad companies. Some people thought he might become the best railroad lawyer in the country. But that is not what happened. In the 1850s, Lincoln returned to national politics. The division over the issue of slavery was deepening. Lincoln was not an anti-slavery activist, an abolitionist. But he did not support the country's policies on slavery. Lincoln believed slavery violated the American Declaration of Independence, which said all men had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To be clear, Lincoln did not believe that black people should have the same rights as white U.S. citizens but he did not agree that one person should own other people or profit from their work while they earned nothing and were held captive. Lincoln decided to compete in elections for a seat in the U.S. Senate. He was chosen as the candidate of a new anti-slavery party. Members called themselves Republicans. During the election campaign, Lincoln famously discussed the issue of slavery in a series of debates with Stephen Douglas, the Democratic Party's candidate. Lincoln's words moved some voters, but they did not earn him enough votes to get elected. So, while Douglas took the seat in the Senate, Lincoln prepared to run for president. Lincoln said that, if he were elected, he would not expand slavery to new territories in the country's west. But he promised not to interfere with slavery in the southern states, where it already existed. Voters in southern slaveholding states did not trust Lincoln. Not a single southern state supported him in the election of 1860. But he won anyway. The support of anti-slavery Northerners gave him the presidency. In answer, seven Southern states withdrew from the Union. Four more later joined them. These states formed a new government called the Confederate States of America, or the Confederacy. Confederate officials chose their own president and wrote their own constitution, which permitted each state control over its own laws, especially laws that protected slavery. Confederate officials said they no longer recognized the power of the U.S. federal government or its chief executive. As that chief executive, Lincoln would have to decide what to do. 
President Lincoln's first test came a little more than a month after he was sworn in. The event involved Fort Sumter, a federal military base on an island off the coast of South Carolina. Soldiers on the base needed food. Lincoln said he would send some by ship. But Confederate officials considered the port part of South Carolina, which belonged to the Confederacy. They demanded that the Union soldiers leave the fort. But Union forces and the U.S. president ignored the Confederates' demands. As promised, Lincoln sent the supply ships. As expected, Confederate soldiers attacked. A day and a half later, the fort's Union soldiers surrendered. The clash did not last long, and no one was killed in the fighting. But the battle at Fort Sumter marked the official beginning of hostilities between the Union and the Confederacy. Lincoln immediately took action to answer the loss at Fort Sumter. He called on state militias for troops and asked for a special meeting of Congress. The President was careful not to ask Congress to make an official declaration of war, in part because he did not want to recognize the Confederacy as a separate nation. Instead, he called the Southern states' opposition a rebellion. However, the conflict between the Southern Confederacy and the Northern Union was a civil war. Neither side expected the fighting to last very long, a few weeks or maybe months. Instead, the Civil War lasted four and a half years. Most of the major battles took place near Washington, D.C., in the states of Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Soldiers and civilians also clashed in the West, in Tennessee, as well as in the southern states of Mississippi, South Carolina, and Georgia. But the war involved the entire country. At least four million men fought in it. Among the soldiers were African American and Native American men. The conflict divided families. Brothers, fathers, and sons fought against each other. Women in both the North and South also supported the war effort. They cooked meals, made and repaired clothing for the troops, served as nurses, and cared for the soldiers. Both white and African-American women also took over the work of men who had left to fight. And more than 620,000 men died. Recent scholarship says as many as 750,000. The Civil War remains the bloodiest war in American history. And it changed the country. The war radically affected American politics, economics, and society. Abraham Lincoln was the U.S. president through all of it. Next week... We will talk more about Lincoln's presidency and his legacy. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.